This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. It has often been a common belief that our world was alive, a superorganism or deity. Could that be true, and if so, might intelligent technological life forms, flying spaceships, be how planets reproduce? Earlier this year, famous chemist and futurist James Lovelock died at the impressive age of 103. Lovelock also had an impressive amount of work, both near-term and speculative, that he leaves behind, on everything from cryopreservation to geoengineering, and worked for MI5, the British security service, for decades, where he was described as, basically Q in the James Bond films. He is probably best known for the Gaia Hypothesis, also known as the Gaia Principle or Paradigm, which comes in a number of variations these days but can be summed up quickly, and mostly accurately, as the notion that Earth itself is alive and self-regulating, a type of superorganism, arguably similar to how humans themselves have countless small cells and unrelated organisms inside us. That life on Earth, its biosphere, in conjunction with its other spheres like the atmosphere and hydrosphere, have regulated feedbacks to keep Earth optimal for life to continue. Such being the case, we might extrapolate that it happens on other planets, or the exact opposite, that it is a near-unique property of Earth's emergent biosphere and the reason the Universe doesn't seem to have ancient alien empires sprawling everywhere, the Fermi Paradox. Today we're going to examine this notion in its various forms, the good and the bad for concepts, and also ask what it would imply toward the galaxy, the Fermi Paradox, and life, the Universe, and everything else. That's a lot of ground to cover so you might want to grab a drink and a snack before we get rolling, and don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons. I feel obliged to say from the outset that while I've always liked the Gaia Hypothesis as a neat concept, I'm very skeptical on it, so as is typical for me I'll try to shelve that skepticism and take a more advocative role for it today, though we won't bypass its criticisms by any means. Now as mentioned, the Guy Hypothesis comes in many forms so let's start with the original one by Lovelock, emphasis on by Lovelock because there's nothing new about speculating that the world itself might in some way be alive or even conscious. A living world is pretty common in mythology of course, the hypothesis derives its name from the Greek goddess of the Earth who is the mother of everything, and that's a fairly common theme in many mythologies and religions under different names but we see it recurring even in modern times and in scientific speculation, particularly in the mid-20th century when telepathy and group consciousness were regularly part of serious scientific discussions. This presumably influenced the name, though Gaia Hypothesis was given to it by Lovelock at the suggestion of William Golding, the Nobel Prize winning writer best known these days for the novel Lord of the Flies. Lovelock began formulating the concept while at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in 1965, and he had been working on ways of detecting life on Mars for JPL. I would imagine he was contemplating possible biosignatures given the paper he produced, planetary atmospheres, compositional, and other changes associated with the presence of life, with C. E. Griffin, as about how life could be detected at the planetary scale by atmosphere chemistry and signatures. He also wrote A Physical Basis for Life Detection Experiments for Nature that year, and its good baseline material for what would emerge as our framework for searching for extraterrestrial life by atmospheric signatures, something which is finally underway nowadays as we grow our catalog of exoplanets and the ability to examine them in detail. At the time though, we could look at Mars and Venus and the papers were basically explaining why their atmospheres, contrasted with Earth's, could be taken as strong evidence against life being there, especially in any quantity. That might seem rather obvious nowadays when we assume any life on either planet, if it exists at all, is fairly minimal, even compared to a desert or tundra, but it was 1965 and the first probe of Mars by the Mariner 4 flyby happened that summer, no rover or landing, or even orbit, and probes of Venus over the few years before that had been at best mixed successes. We didn't even confirm Venus had a retrograde rotation until 1964 and until the 1960s many folks still thought Venus was a paradise planet because of its cloud layer. Now we know those clouds are made of acid and the sweltering hot planet below is less a paradise than a suburb of hell. 
That's the state of play when Lovelock first proposed the Gaia Hypothesis, and again it had some revision over the years, by himself and others. Another thing of that era was that the term cybernetics still meant any complicated system with lots of feedback and regulatory processes, like traffic or supplies moving around a city. It hadn't come to be synonymous with people with metal limbs or cyborgs, cybernetic organisms, another term coined around then. In the book Gaia, Lovelock himself explains the principles of cybernetics on a simple kitchen oven with a thermostat, so a cybernetic earth or earth with cybernetic feedbacks is another term in those early discussions that can be misleading, and I emphasize that because the Gaia hypothesis tended to attract a lot of spiritual or New Age elements, but they're not really pertinent to the theory itself. But it will sometimes get included as the New Sphere, a philosophical concept proposed by biochemist Vladimir Vernatsky and philosopher and Jesuit priest Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, both of whose names I probably just mispronounced, as an analogy to the geosphere, biosphere, and atmosphere, representing the highest development of a biosphere's development, as when humankind or other intelligent life for other planets, capable of cognition and technology on conscious organization, begin seriously transforming the biosphere and planet, in our case beginning with early roads, canals, and irrigation, and they argue it was as legitimate a sphere for the planet as the geosphere, lithosphere, biosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, baryosphere, and so on, which I tend to agree with. Beyond that it tended to drift into divorced spiritual realms of group consciousness or Omega Point speculation, which we'll bypass for now, or in more modern times as a particularly high-tech version of the internet, and I've used Newsphere in that context myself occasionally and is popular in some sci-fi, especially the cyberpunk genre, typically as a given plant's complete communication, data, and computerization sphere. Anyway, all those various spheres though, neurosphere or not, tend to have some feedback on each other. That, in and of itself, is neither surprising nor controversial, nor is it that some of those feedbacks can help push a system back into alignment. A predator that overeats can grow in population but only temporarily, then crashes down from a shortage of prey and higher probabilities of not just starvation but any number of food shortage related things, like a higher chance of getting into fights with their own kind over territory and dying from an infection that's harder to fight off because they're running in a calorie deficit. These don't have to involve life forms either, heat a planet with surface water up and it will get cloudier, clouds reflect sunlight away, which can have a cooling effect, but it's also important to note that the same effect can have both positive and negative feedback. Clouds also absorb infrared light from the surface and help retain it, and how high they are in the atmosphere controls which dominates. So too, ice and especially fresh snow reflect sunlight, which cools a planet, which is why we sometimes think the planet may have frozen over completely in the past, possibly repeatedly. If Earth ran into a particularly bad ice age and just froze a little more across some threshold where too much sunlight got reflected and froze all the oceans, with ever less water evaporating to form clouds, and all freezes over and cannot melt, the cooling effects snowball until the planet is locked in ice. This is the appropriately named Snowball Earth Theory, in such a case though you could slowly have volcanic eruptions and space dust darken the surface till it absorb more light and thawed. The Gaia Hypothesis reasons that life on a planet will become self-regulating, in conjunction with the atmosphere, hydrosphere, and pedosphere, the thin skin above the lithosphere where soil is and where soil formation is occurring at, from the Greek word pedon, or ground. And again the idea that the planet has feedback, so even a planetary homeostasis resulting from life forms on it, is not a new idea, and was not even when Lovelock discussed it but rather the Gaia Hypothesis argues we have a homeostatic balance of conditions on Earth with the goal of keeping conditions optimal for life, even in regard to things like volcanoes or external things like asteroid collisions. One big factor seen as being in favor is that its external conditions have changed a lot since life began. The Sun is now at least 25% brighter than it used to be, which in simplest models would see the planet be about 6% warmer, which is a big deal in absolute temperature or Kelvin. Earth's current average temperature is about 14 Celsius or 57 Fahrenheit, 6% doesn't sound like much on those scales, but our absolute temperature is 287 Kelvin or 517 Rankine, raising that by 6% is 304 Kelvin or 548 Rankine, 
which is 31 Celsius or 89 Fahrenheit. Again, 6% is much bigger in absolute temperature terms. So the planet should have been a lot colder back then, even accounting for the higher temperature of the planet after forming and greater amounts of uranium decaying in the planet. The faint young sun paradox is still troubling us, 50 years after Carl Sagan and George Mullen proposed it, as it indicates our world should have been an ice ball for a long while. We have partial explanations, everything from more carbon dioxide to tidal heating from the moon being greater when it was closer to us in the past, to Earth maybe being closer to the Sun in the past, I've even heard local Hubble expansion suggested. Lovelock himself has suggested a higher methane composition in the early atmosphere, akin to Titan's atmosphere. Overall though, the faint young Sun paradox tends to work against the Gaia hypothesis being valid for early Earth, that prior to maybe half a billion years ago there couldn't have been a life-based self-regulating planet. To some degree this is irrelevant since not only have we massively altered what we think the early conditions on Earth were since Lovelock's time, repeatedly, but we don't actually have a solid notion even now of what the atmosphere and temperature look like. Anything before half a billion years ago is very thin, and the picture doesn't really get that much more solid until after the dinosaurs are gone. Paleoclimatology does amazing work on little data but it has its limits, so realistically we can't take any early conditions on Earth into serious consideration for proving or disproving the idea that the planet self-regulates with the goal of keeping optimal conditions for life. The core hypothesis is very attractive to be sure, and many objections to it have been adapted for in newer versions, but it's not too hard to find problems. For instance, the Huronian glaciation about 2.4 billion years ago is believed to be a series of Ice Age periods lasting around 300 million years, possibly with one or more Snowball Earth events. Life existed before this but was very minimal, as before that time life was anaerobic, but this is when cyanobacteria evolved photosynthesis and exploded due to this vastly more abundant energy source and resulted in tons of oxygen appearing as a waste product of this vastly more abundant life. Lots of things absorb oxygen, including methane if that was indeed abundant at this time, and iron, so the planet oxidized until it got saturated and we saw a rise of atmospheric oxygen. If the atmosphere was high in methane as we currently believe, then the oxygen would have bonded with it and produced water and carbon dioxide, same as when we burn other hydrocarbons, cooling the planet. You're probably wondering why a sudden uptick in carbon dioxide and water would cool a planet, given that they are both infamous as greenhouse gases, but everything is relative, and methane is a much stronger greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide or water vapor, so ironically the spike in both from reducing methane into them cooled the planet, we assume. Once methane and the other oxygen sinks began diminishing, atmospheric oxygen built up to even higher levels which killed off most of the remaining life, but this period is thought to be when eukaryotic cells, ones with a nucleus, and multicellular life both first appeared. This is often viewed as the first and longest extinction event, sometimes called the Oxygen Holocaust, but given that it is a period of many millions of years, it is arguable if that is the proper term. This actually gives us what is called the Medea Hypothesis, coined by paleontologist Peter Ward as an anti-Gaia hypothesis arguing that multicellular life and any superorganism may be inherently self-destructive or suicidal. Medea is also from Greek mythology, specifically Jason and the Argonauts. Medea is the granddaughter of the sun god Helios and a sorceress, and she initially helps Jason on his quest for the Golden Fleece, and they eventually marry, happily ever after. However, in keeping with Greek tragedies, they end up souring on each other and she also later kills her own children. Hence Medea as Earth or life seems at first helpful to life surviving but in the end is ruinous to it. In this context microbial triggered mass extinctions result in a return to a micro-dominated state, which has been the case for most of Earth's history. Indeed one could argue it's never not micro-dominated as they not only make up the overwhelming majority of organisms on this planet, but the majority of its non-plant biomass outmassing animals, even tiny ones, by about 25 to 1. The oxygen catastrophe is one of those events, a lot of the snowball Earths of the Huronian and later, a period sometimes called the Cryogenian from 790 to 630 million years ago, which may have been snowball Earth periods though this is very contested. 
We also had the Permian-Triassic extinction event or Great Dying roughly 250 million years ago, which among other things is considered to be the largest known mass extinction of insects, not that tons of other things didn't go extinct too. It is usually placed at the feet of oceanic anoxia and acidification from large amounts of carbon dioxide. Peter Ward also suggests that current global warming would be another such Medea event. Now at this point I feel obliged to point out that both the Gaia Hypothesis and Medea Hypothesis have some philosophical issues from a scientific standpoint, both are strongly implying intent here, albeit often the same incidental way explanations of evolution do, where someone is trying to explain evolution and doing it badly and unintentionally gives us an example of intelligent design instead, or implies an intent to natural selection. And that does happen a lot with the Gaia Hypothesis, people using bad analogies for it or overextending what the basic theory is saying. The names probably don't help for that, and while self-regulating cybernetic planets might have been a better pick in that regard, it is a little late now. Furthermore, Lovelock preferred the name Gaia due to its emphasis on living planets as opposed to some alternative names suggested for the Gaia hypothesis such as coevolution or Earth System Science. Teleology is what we call it when a reason or explanation for something is based on its end state, purpose, or goal. My car is built around the purpose of getting me from point A to B safely and efficiently. If you are describing evolution from a teleological standpoint, in terms of having intended goals or outcomes, that can still be evolution, but not Darwinian evolution. And indeed a lot of times when folks seek to describe survival of the fittest and natural selection, it can slide into this area too. Saying that the purpose of a planet is to spawn life that can grow in complexity to either launch spaceborne organisms out, or complex organisms like humans who can make spacecraft and spread life to other worlds, that is teleological. The existence of such a planet is not itself disproven by that though, should you bump into one it presumably won't vanish. Incidentally, evolutionary biology is a field from which a lot of the criticism of the Gaia Hypothesis came, even from scientists that often disagreed with each other such as Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Dawkins. Specifically Dawkins felt it impossible for a planetary superorganism to arise by natural selection and insisted that the Gaia Hypothesis does not follow from his own concept of extended phenotype, the notion that genes can have physical manifestations outside the bodies they belong to such as a beaver gene influencing the shape of a beaver dam, or a honeybee gene the shape of the hive and honeycomb, or genes of parasitic organisms influencing phenotypes of their host. That doesn't mean Dawkins is right either, though I tend to agree, and this discussion is all collegial and theoretical and few folks criticize Lovelock's skill as a scientist and thinker, but again it has the problem of being teleological which tends to raise scientific objections. That doesn't make it wrong, mind you, but it is implying either consciousness involved or some guiding motivation, like God. Obviously this was fine for Pierre Teilhard de Chardin when proposing the Neurosphere and the Omega Point, given he was a Jesuit. The Omega Point, which could easily be its own episode, can be summarized and oversimplified as the idea that the universe spirals toward a point of unification in a distant future. It has a lot of similarities with the concept of a technological singularity, including lots of supporters and detractors from different philosophical and theological camps. Sort of like today's concept, it's one I tend to disagree with but find fascinating. Even in versions of the Omega Point where we have a retro-causal god or megamind, like a Matrioska brain or the Eschaton from Charlie Strauss's excellent novel Singularity Sky, this is one that evolves from nothing and can poke back in time to guide its own existence into play, and so you still have the guiding hand pushing things along even if it has a temporal paradox stuffed in there too. Teleological arguments are obviously frowned on by science, but not necessarily wrong. For instance it's perfectly fine in sociology and economics, where you have many different people and groups openly with objectives they're pursuing, including regulating the system of our economy or civilization. But in biology, geology, chemistry, and physics, they tend to be seen as red flags that a theory is walking on thin ice, but again, doesn't have to be wrong. Even ignoring the obvious example, that the planet did have a collective consciousness or that there was a classic creator god, you also have the example of terraforming. Odds are the most common ways planets will get life, or have gotten life, is because some place that already had it 
sent out ships or seeds to go plant it elsewhere, including a lot of careful engineering and balancing, and that clearly would have intent and goals and purposes in mind. As a soft case of the Anthropic Principle and the Salerian Hypothesis that evidence of past civilization wouldn't endure many millions of years, if you find yourself on a life-bearing planet, it would seem statistically more likely that life did not arise there naturally but rather was planted from an older world, and thus most planets' life would be shaped to a goal or purpose by an actual designer, the terraforming program or committee that first introduced it. Lovelock himself though denied there's any teleology in the theory and blamed it on the name tending to predispose folks to that view of it. I'm inclined to agree with at least the last half of that. He said back in 1990, after his book Gaia, A New Look at Life on Earth came out, that nowhere in our writings do we express that the planetary self-regulation is purposeful or involves foresight or planning by the biota. And that's why I've been emphasizing that the Gaia Hypothesis comes in a lot of forms, because some of the versions of the Gaia Hypothesis that have been championed are explicitly teleological or openly spiritual, which again does not necessarily make them wrong, but has certainly been where a lot of the wrath from other scientists has been sparked and directed. You can have self-regulation without consciousness or goals, obviously, there is self-regulation in every organism. Local ecosystems tend to be full of these, but they're never truly stable. And why should they be? There's not an actual mechanism after all. A mechanism has intent or purpose itself. It's always a problem in trying to discuss biology, we tend to be prone to phrasing things with intent or purpose even when we're trying not to. It's sort of like saying our survival instinct where we tend to imply we have some wild command to not die, like Asma's Third Law of Robotics, rather than a huge collection of unrelated traits that tend to make something die less in most cases, and which affect our behavior, hence why people can commit suicide and an Asmovian robot cannot. Evolution may not have goals, but it's nigh impossible to discuss the topic without accidentally implying it, and I think Lovelock's point was that folks tended to do that with the Gaia Hypothesis. This has resulted though in what we could call weak, moderate, and strong forms of the Gaia Hypothesis, where strong Gaia would be organisms obeying a principle that makes Earth optimal for life while a weaker form would be merely favorable rather than optimal, a moderate form would be where it was simply a homeostatic mechanism. Some feel that's still too strong but that we could have a co-evolutionary Gaia or an influential Gaia, where there's a linkage and a relationship, lots of feedback that tends to push toward the Earth being shifted by life to be more favorable to life, but nothing stronger, neither of which as I mentioned earlier was new or radical thought in terms of already accepted discussion of natural selection, adaptation, and evolution. Since I'm a physicist, not a biologist, I can get away with being officially neutral on the matter, Though I would say anything beyond the homeostatic mechanism is a stretch for Earth itself. In terms of other planets it's certainly an option, we have discussed sentient planets evolving before, see our episode Ward Consciousness and Sentient Planets for more on that. And in the spirit of the Silurian Hypothesis, I suppose we could point out that Earth could have previously have had a consciousness and limited self-regulatory ability as a superorganism, conscious or subconscious, and that it died off. It wouldn't really be something we could detect, especially if it wasn't particularly anthropomorphic, especially millions of years later. I don't think I've heard that idea used before in speculation or fiction, which might make for an interesting story I suppose, so we can call it the Pangu Hypothesis. As an example of a planet mind whose corpse we're living on, that one is also popular in mythology, the world being made of dead gods but most I can't pronounce and were killed by some other god like Tiamat being killed by Mordu, whereas Pangu of Chinese mythology just died unreplaced as I understand it. We will call it the Tiamat Hypothesis when you get successive mortal ward minds replacing each other, or sub-ward minds. There's also the Claw Hypothesis, a cousin of the Gaia Hypothesis that is an acronym for its four originators' last names, of which Lovelock was one, that is a proposed negative feedback loop between ocean ecosystems and Earth's climate. One can imagine rival planetary consciousness or non-sentient driving forces colliding into each other, possibly Uranus and Pontus to keep to the Gaian mythology. 
Again, the Gaia hypothesis doesn't require that, but it's interesting for speculation, and it's something we could see evolve elsewhere, or for that matter, engineer. Let's wrap up by considering a bigger version of this though. Let's imagine in all the starry universe, only one in a trillion worlds ever spawns life on its own, and yet the vast majority of the worlds presumably will end up either transformed into life-bearing worlds or disassembled to be turned into their more artificial cousins, space habitats. Presumably those few worlds that not only have life emerge, one in a trillion, versus the smaller percentage where it not only endures, but eventually is able to spread itself to other places, would seem to be every bit as valid as an example of adaptation and survival of the fittest as that first amoeba or proto-life, and if we're discussing civilization as entities or even planetary consciousnesses, it's worth noting that life in this galaxy a few million years from now might tend to be composed of things that would make even a world brain look primitive, let alone a human, just as we are to an amoeba or whatever first had a basic brain eons later. To a galaxy like that, originated from one single world and yet composed of trillions of them, where humans might just be the equivalent of gut bacteria to those trillions of megaminds, things might seem very different. Looking back from potentially hundreds of billions of years from now, might they not view Earth and its journey to civilization and interstellar colonization, all those worlds and all those galaxies left together from Hubble expansion, descended from just one world, little more than an egg or an amoeba? I'm not sure viewing us this way should be humbling, or reeks of ego and destiny, maybe both, but it certainly does give a different view of things, maybe we are just part of the mechanism our world is using to grow and reproduce itself. Science often surprises us with new truths at odds with our current understanding, so maybe it will turn out the Gaia hypothesis is right to one degree or another and the world is itself alive. That's the neat thing about science, always another new and awesome discovery that changes our worldview, and in this case, maybe our view of our world itself. Math and science are amazing to know and incredibly useful in daily life, but they can be intimidating to learn, and that's where our friends at Brilliant can help. Brilliant has thousands of lessons on math, science, and computer science, with exclusive new content added monthly and a focus on hands-on learning, which is hands down the best way to learn. Whether it's the basics or wanting to learn college level material in a tiny fraction of the time and cost, Brilliant has lessons that can help you, and help level up your knowledge of math, science, and computer science. With Brilliant you can learn at your own pace, learn on the go, and learn a little something new every day. Visit Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur or click on the link in the description, and the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual, premium subscription. So next week we'll be having our Thanksgiving episode, Thursday, November 24th, for reasons to be optimistic about the future, followed by our monthly livestream Q&A two Sundays from now, then it's on to December to discuss what we should do if SETI ever succeeds and picks up a signal from an alien civilization. And then the week after that, we'll contemplate what if they never do, and if it turns out that humanity is the first civilization to ever arise in all the cosmos. If you want alerts when those and other episodes come out, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell. And if you enjoyed today's episode and would like to help support future episodes, please visit our website IsaacArthur.net for ways to donate, or become a show patron over at Patreon. Those and other options like our awesome social media forums for discussing futuristic concepts can be found in the links in the description. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.